Okay, so I think it's time for us to get started. Um, so, so this class, we're going to continue our discussion on the nitrogen oxides, more specifically on the control of the nitrogen oxides, right? So uh, we can again do a recap of we have learned what we have learned last class. Uh, so mainly last class, we introduced different types of nitrogen oxides, right? I mentioned that the major difference from the uh, sulfur oxides is that uh, the NOx has a family of of a chemical species, right? It can be nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, N2O, N2O5, and so on and so forth, right? Um, but we mentioned that each of them will have a, a different um, stability under different temperature. So basically nitrogen monoxide is more stable at high temperature, right? And um, nitrogen dioxide is more stable under low temperature. So we also mentioned um, something called the equilibrium. We calculate the equilibrium concentration of the NOx or nitrogen mon monoxide under different temperature. Um, so I think we can do a quick quiz about uh, the question here. So how does the temperature affect the NOx formation under equilibrium? There's three options here. Okay, five more seconds. All right, we'll just stop here. Um, so most of you guys got the correct answer. So in general, the higher the temperature, the more NOx formation. I mentioned that it's mainly because of the equilibrium constant, right? So uh, in terms of the reaction, in terms of the reaction of uh, of nitrogen plus oxygen forming two numbers of nitrogen monoxide, we mentioned that this equilibrium constant, which is NO concentration to the power of two divided by nitrogen concentration and oxygen concentration. So this Kp here is going to almost increase exponentially with, uh, with the temperature. Right, so what that means is if we have a higher temperature, then we have a higher uh, equilibrium constant. It means that we're going to have a higher concentration of the nitrogen monoxide. So what about time? Um, so we mentioned that the temperature effect is when it's under equilibrium, right? So we also mentioned that under a lot of combustion conditions, for example, uh, the car um, engines or the coal-fired power plants, uh, that all, uh, we, we're not going to have an infinitely long time to wait it until it, get, it gets to equilibrium, right? So we have to consider the, the transient formation of the nitrogen monoxide or the kinetics here. So how does time affect the NOx formation? We have another quiz. Uh, let's see. Okay, 10 more seconds. All right, we'll stop here. Uh, so again, most of you get the correct answer. The longer the time, the more NOx formation, right? 
Um, so um, I can understand why some of you chose the option that Knox is independent of time. Um, that's that basically means it's under equilibrium, right? But we mentioned under a lot of the combustion conditions, it is never going to reach the equilibrium. It's going to uh, be a function of time. And the longer the time, the more Knox formation. Um, so here we were still talking about one type of the Knox, which is the thermal Knox. So the thermal Knox, we mentioned that it's just, um, if we even if we raise the temperature of the mixed air up to a certain temperature, we're going to have uh, Knox formation. So there's another type of Knox formation, which is a fuel Knox. So fuel Knox happens in a way that um, basically a nitrogen uh, element or atom is bonded to some organics. And this happens for the, uh, for example, the coal or natural gas, mainly because in coal or in fossil fuels, so it's mainly composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then if we further count down, that's going to be sulfur and nitrogen. Okay, so there's always some nitrogen in the fuel. So for the fuel NOx, it's going to be quite similar to sulfur. I mentioned that the sulfur in the in the fuel. If you combust with oxygen, and then you are going to form sulfur dioxide, right? And similarly for the nitrogen that's bonded to the um, um, to the organics or to the fossil fuel, if you burn it with oxygen, it's also going to form some proportion of the NOx. But because nitrogen is quite special, you're also going to form nitrogen gas here. Okay, so basically. Uh, the, the nitrogen is going to get um, uh, it's going to get oxidized or but get reducted into the nitrogen, which is a more stable form of the nitrogen. Okay, so it's it's always going to be a mixture of the nitrogen uh, uh, oxides and uh, nitrogen gas here. Okay, so we can talk about this later in the, uh, in the few slides later. Okay. So if we just recall this figure here, so this figure shows uh, more uh, clearly on how the NOx formation may be affected by time and affected by temperature. So let's say uh, if we just uh, look at this curve here, if we pick any curve, if we just look at this one. So this curve shows the uh, nitrogen monoxide concentration when it's being introduced into the flame and stayed for 0.1 seconds. So we're controlling the time to be a constant. But what you see is that if we increase the temperature of the flame or increase the temperature of the combustion, the concentration of the NOx is going to increase almost exponentially, right? At around 3,200 uh, Fahrenheit, you have 10 ppm. If you increase it to 3,800 uh, Fahrenheit, we're going to get almost around 3,000 ppm, right? So this shows how the temperature affects the nitrogen monoxide formation. So this is a temperature. We can also look at the time. So the way we look at, look at the time is going to, we need to draw a vertical line here, right? And then each of this vertical line is going to have an, uh, 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 basically an intercept with this curve here. So you can see that if it just stays for 0 0.1, 0 0.01 seconds, you have concentration of around 100 ppm. If it stays for 0.1 second, you have around 1,000 ppm. Or if it stays under uh, the flame for around one second, the concentration is around 6,000 ppm. So this clearly show that the temperature, uh, how the temperature and time affect the uh, nitrogen monoxide formation, which is if we increase these two parameters, we're going to get more NOx formation, right? So we also talked briefly about this plot so what this plot is showing us is um, basically how does the nitrogen monoxide concentration depend on the oxygen? So here on the x-axis, we have this term called equivalence ratio. So we mentioned that the equivalence ratio or this phi here is defined as the air that's required by stoichiometry divided by the actual air, okay? Or actual amount of air. So we give the example of carbon combustion uh, last class. So similarly, let's say if we talk about methane combustion, then we know that one number of methane is going to react with two number of oxygen. 
and that's going to form carbon dioxide and two number of water, right? So what this means is that under stoichiometry, one number of the, um, uh, let's say one mole of the methane is going to require two moles of the um, oxygen, right? But if we provide four mole of the oxygen, then that means according to this equation, that's going to, to be two divided by four, which is 0.5. So in general, <clears throat> as defined by, the, by this sentence here, so if a phi is smaller than one, that is air rich. And if phi is larger than one, that is called fuel rich. Okay, and if we have phi equal to one, that means the air that we provided to combustion is equal to the air that we provide to the stoichiometry, and that means stoichiometry. Right, so this is basically how we define different um, equivalence ratio here. So, um, of course, if we want to combust all of the fuel gas, if we want to combust all of the, let's say the, 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 the diesel, um, diesel gas or, or typical gasoline, we want to make sure that uh, we're under the situation of air rich or at least stoichiometry, right? Otherwise, we're basically just wasting the fuel. Maybe under the fuel rich condition, we're not going to combust all of those hydro hydrocarbons, right? So here, what this plot shows us is how the nitrogen monoxide formation or the concentration is affected by stoichiometry or sto uh, by, affected by the equivalence ratio, okay? So if you draw this vertical line at equivalence ratio equal to one, so this means we're providing the air that's required by the stoichiometry, right? But if you further check, what is a nitrogen monoxide peak? So you can see that the peak is always at the range where phi is smaller than one, okay? So basically the more air you provide into the combustion, the more nitrogen monoxide you will get, okay? So generally for diesel engines, let's say for car engines, um, which typically burn gasoline, it's quite surprising that they're actually burning these uh, hydrocarbons at a fuel rich condition. So if you check the, um, the mechanism of the, uh, uh, of the internal engines, let's say for the cars or for the, for the diesel, um, generally we burn these hydrocarbons at a phi larger than one, which is trying to reduce the NOx formation, okay? So then you may have the question, then we're going to form a lot of hydrocarbons, right? hydrocarbons or VOCs are also bad for our environment. So the way we deal with, with that is we're, we're gonna use the catalytic converters. So basically we use the catalytic converters to convert these hydrocarbon into carbon dioxide and water, okay? So for car engines, we're not going to burn the uh, fuels under a air rich condition. Typically it's a little bit fuel rich, okay? Mainly we're trying to deal with the NOx, from, uh, NOx situation here. So this is the car engines. So what about the coal combustion? So here it's giving us the, uh, basically how does the uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen oxides or the NOx depend on the equivalence ratio for coal combustion, okay? So here uh, they use an, another term called the fuel equivalence ratio, but it, it's basically the, the same as we defined. That's a phi here, okay? So this is plotting for different coal uh, species. It can be lignite uh, or it can be uh, bituminous. So basically have different sizes for the coal. And again, if we draw a vertical line here, you can find this is basically um, the situation corresponding to the stoichiometry. Right? And then we mentioned that if it's phi is smaller than one, that means air rich. And if phi is larger than one, that is fuel rich. So clearly you can see under air rich condition, we're going to have a higher fraction of the nitrogen oxides, right? So if you further look at this uh, Y scale here, 
This is called the percent uh, conversion to nitrogen oxides. So what this means is we're talking about the co-particles might, uh, or the co-composition might have this structure where the nitrogen is bonded with the organics, right? So for these nitrogen, they have two, um, basically they have two uh, destination, right? It's either going to form NOx or they're going to form nitrogen, okay? So what this conversion means is, let's say we have 100 numbers of the uh, nitrogen molecule, uh, nitrogen atoms here. Then if we have a 60% conversion, then that means we're going to form 60 numbers of the, um, of the NOx. Well, for the number of the nitrogen, that's going to be 20 because for each nitrogen, there are two nitrogen uh, atoms, right? So what this means is that if we have a air rich condition, then we're going to form more NOx. And then this, this fraction is going to be higher and higher if we provide more air into the system. So now we have another parameter. Let's say we mentioned that temperature, time, and then we have another one, that's oxygen, right? So if the oxygen concentration also increases, then we're going to have more NOx formation, right? So this is basically the general idea. Three parameters are going to affect the NOx formation. Um, so here I also have an example problem, and this is the example in your textbook. So let's say um, uh, the problem it describes is that we're going to burn a hundred, a uh, thousand kilograms of coal per hour. Okay? And also the coal has 2% of nitrogen. This is by weight. So we're talking about these nitrogens here. It occupies around 2% by weight. So it's burning at a, uh, at a temperature of, of 1600 Kelvin. If you see for this plot here, showing the 600, 1600 Kelvin temperature here. So we can basically use this curve here. And it uses an air fuel ratio that is twice of the stoichiometric ratio. So what this sentence tell us is that it's basically introducing more air into the system. Right? It's using an air to fuel ratio that is twice of the stoichiometric ratio. So basically we're introducing twice of the oxygen. Shoot. And just say it's twice of oxygen that's required by stoichiometry, right? So what this also means is that the, the equivalence ratio or the fuel equivalence ratio is going to be 0.5. So it wants us to use fig, the figure 16.4, um, ignore any uh, thermal NOx, right? We're talking about the fuel NOx to estimate the mass emission rate of the nitrogen oxides. So it wants us to calculate what is an emission rate of nitrogen monoxide. And if, we, if they at, uh, they're emitted at lower temperature, we know that these nitrogen monoxide are going to convert, get converted into nitrogen dioxide. So it wants us to calculate the emission rate in these two um, criteria or in these two forms. So the way we deal with this problem is first, if we already know what is the amount of coal that's being combusted, then we can calculate the mass flow rate of the nitrogen, which is 1,000 multiplied by 2%. That's 20 kilogram per hour, right? And then we need to find out what is the conversion of this nitrogen into the nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide, right? So we have to refer to this graph. We know that the, the uh, equivalence ratio is 0.5. So we're going to draw a vertical line here, and you can find out that that's around 35%. So what this means is that 35% of these nitrogen are going to get converted into either nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide, right? So we can have uh, basically the, the amount of nitrogen converting to NOx, that's 20 multiplied by 35%, and that is seven kilogram per hour. And this is still talking about nitrogen. Now we just need to convert this amount into either nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. So I think that's quite easy to solve. We just need to basically um, use this seven multiplied by the molecular weight of an O.
divided by the molecular weight of the nitrogen, and then seven multiplied by molecular weight of NO2, divided by the molecular weight of nitrogen, okay? So um, you can do the further the calculation, and I think it's going to be quite easy to solve, mainly because the nitrogen has a molecular weight of 14 grams per mole, right? So we can calculate those out. So this is how we can um, calculate how much nitrogen uh, oxides we're going to get from the um, coal combustion, okay? So now, since we already know these parameters, these influencing parameters affecting NOx formation. So how do we reduce the NOx formation? We're talking about NOx control, right? So what are the strategies to control the thermal and fuel NOx? So I'm listing three parameters, uh, three numbers here. So we're going to just talk about these three parameters. I mentioned that the temperature is affecting the um, NOx formation. So we had to reduce the temperature, right? Time affects NOx formation. We can reduce the time. And then oxygen affects the NOx formation. We have to reduce the oxygen, okay? So some of them might look quite counterintuitive, mainly because we're using the heat of the, uh, of the coal combustion to generate electricity, right? But if we reduce the temperature, are we still going to get enough heat? Or we're trying to burn all of the coal to generate heat, right? But if we reduce the oxygen, are we still going to generate electricity? But there are ways to uh, bypass these problems if we design our combustion system, okay? So, um, so in terms of NOx control, uh, let's say for the, uh, if we think back on the sulfur dioxide control, okay? So sulfur dioxide control, we mentioned that there's fuel um, desulfurization. and flue gas desulfurization. Okay. So it's either before combustion or after combustion, right? But for NOx control, we have another strategy that is called in combustion. So basically this is also called as the combustion modification. All right. So the combustion modification means we're trying to deal with these problems when we combust the coal particles. And of course, uh, for NOx control, we can also use the flue gas, uh, flue gas control techniques. Maybe we shouldn't call this uh, desulfurization anymore. We should call this the um, nitrogen uh, or reducing the nitrogen concentration, right? Or denitrification. So, um, so we can first talk about the incombustion method, which is the combustion modification. So you can see the strategy that the textbook give us align very well with our understanding, right? We can reduce the peak temperature. We should reduce the gas residence time. And also we should re reduce the oxygen content, right? But there are some um, additional things we want to point out, right? So for example, for the peak temperature, this is talk talking about the peak temperature. It's not talking about the entire combustion temperature, right? Because we mentioned that the uh, equivalent constant increased exponentially with temperature. So basically the, the NOx formation is decided by the peak temperature, right? It doesn't matter about the overall temperature in the, in the, um, in the coal boiler. It's mainly the highest temperature because if we have a, a region that has a very, very high temperature, then we're going to form a lot of NOx in that region. Okay. So the method we can adopt is we can use a fuel rich a primary flame zone. So by using the fuel rich condition, we're basically adding more fuel and then the oxygen is not enough. So that's going to reduce the temperature. So we can also increase the rate of the flame cooling. So this is done by introducing more air into the uh, combustor, okay? So this means we add more fuel, right? And this means we, we can add more air into the combustor to reduce the temperature. Or we can also decrease the adiabatic flame temperature by dilution. This is also means that we can add air, right? So in terms of reducing the gas residence time, 
it also has constraints that we're talking about the hottest part of the flame zone, okay, or the peak temperature, because the overall temperature or the overall resonance time, um, the NOx coming from those scenarios is going to be very different if we're talking about the NOx formation in the, in the hottest zone, while the gas, if the gas has a relatively longer time in that zone there, then we're going to more, form more NOx, okay? So the method we can adopt are, we can change the shape of the flame zone, or we can also use the steps that's listed here. Okay? So for example, instead of burning, um, let's say, instead of burning the coal in a flame that looks like this, right? If the flame is like this, then you have a longer, um, basically you have a longer distance in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the hottest part of the flame, right? So instead of burning the coal like this, we may burn the coal in, in this way, right? We can inject, inject the coal into the boiler and let the flame look like this. So the flue gas will go in this way, right? So the resonance time will become shorter. And finally, in terms of the oxygen content, um, so we can reduce the overall excess air rates. So for coal combustion, we always burn them at an equivalence ratio below one. Okay, so this is try, trying to use all of the energy coming out of these fossil, uh, fossil fuels here. So what this means is that maybe instead of providing, let's say 100% more air into the system, we can reduce that to 50% more air or even 25% more air into the combustor. Right? So if we have a smaller amount of oxygen, we can have smaller amount of the NOx. And we can also control the mixing of the fuel and air or we can use a few rich primary flame zones. So it's basically the same as this one. Here. So if we add more fuel into the system, um, we can reduce both the temperature and also reduce the oxygen content, right? So based on these criteria, based on these methods, these are what people finally come up with in terms of techniques, okay? So this is in combustion, uh, again, in combustion, NOx control, okay? So these are the names of the techniques uh, that people came up with. So the first one is called the low excess air firing. Uh, it is quite straightforward to uh, understand what it means, right? We just provide fewer air into the combustion. Well, but we still want to make sure that the equivalence ratio is below one, which is under the air rich condition. Mainly the air is still rich, but it's not that rich, right? And uh, we can also use the technique called off, off stoichiometric combustion or the OSC. So this is often called as the overfire air. So this is the most widely used method in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, in combustion modification. Okay, so OFA, this is the most widely used method. Um, so basically, this is controlling the, the ratio between the fuel and air, okay? So we can also use the flue gas recirculation. So what that means is, let's say we have the, uh, we have the combustor here, right? We're burning coals in this way. This is a flame, right? Coal are going this way. These are the pipes at the top of the boiler. The flue gas will go out, the temperature cools down, and then we will extract some proportion of the uh, flue gas back into the coal boiler. So by introducing the flue gas back into the coal boiler, um, there are two, uh, basically achieve two goals, right? So we reduce the temperature, mainly because the temperature here is already low enough. And also it reduced the oxygen amount, right? The flue gas, and uh, basically a lot of the oxygen are converted into carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide are not going to contribute anything to the, to the reaction or water. So the oxygen amount reduced, okay? So in this way, we can uh, reduce the, uh, basically reduce the NOx formation. So we can also reduce the air preheat or reduce the firing rates. So this is uh, about mainly about controlling the capacity, right? So the firing rate is how much coal we provide to the body then the capacity will also reduce in terms of the entire power plant. 
So the air preheat, what that means is generally when we introduce air into the boiler, um, we generally will mix the air or exchange, exchange the temperature with the um, introduced air with the flue gas. So basically some um, energy, thermal energy is going to get introduced to the air in here. So in this way, uh, we're basically introducing warmer air for the combustion. But what this means is that we can reduce that air preheat to lower the temperature in the combustor. And we can also use water injection. So this is um, a very direct way, right? Just introduce water droplets and then because they evaporate, they can absorb more heat. And we're also diluting the entire combustible air mixture to reduce the temperature. Okay, so these are all the methods that people can use. But as I mentioned, the overfair air, this is the most widely used method. So how do we achieve that? And before we know how we can introduce the overfair air, we first have to know how are the coals being combusted, right? So here what I'm showing is a nozzle for introducing the coal particles into the combust. So generally uh, for a coal combustor or the coal boiler, uh, they're going to look like this, okay? So there are nozzles that are fixed on the walls while you introduce coal particles into the combustor. And then you also have air being introduced with it. So here it shows how does the nozzle looks like in here, okay? So basically we're going to introduce the air from the side of this nozzle. You see this tiny gap here. Because of the gap, the velocity through the nozzle will be very high, the velocity of the air. But in the center, this is the coal splitter or the, a tube that introduced this uh, powerized coal and some proportion of the air, right? Because we cannot just directly feed in solid in here. So the power as coal will be carried by some air that are introduced in here. But because of the higher velocity of the surrounding air, so these coal particles are going to get entrained. They're going to get pulled into the combustion zone or into the coal boiler. And if we have a high temperature, then we can combust all of these uh, coal particles. So the real flame nozzle are going to look quite um, uh, intense in terms of the combustion. And here I have a picture showing the, um, how does the coal nozzle looks like, coal feed nozzle looks like. And you can see that the flame lens is uh, very high here, right? I don't think this is a real coal bar burner because you see this chair here. So this might look like a lab, but uh, I think it failed the safety criteria. There's no way we can put some wood nearby the flame. Right? Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the coal combustion is not like burning these charcoals. It's not like you're doing the barbecue, right? So we first need to grind all of these coal particles into tiny, uh, all of these coal into tiny particles. So they perform like particulate matter, right? They behave like um, PM. And that is going to be easier for us to combust them. Uh, so here I also have two short videos about how um, these coal are being, being burned. Let me see if I can just show that here. like the cold nozzles we have shown. Flame is very long inside the boiler. And the, the cold boiler can also have a very, very large dimension. This is a boiler of a 500 megawatt of fire power. You see a lot of nozzles are being used. I think this is just a warming up process, which means that we're not using all of the coal feeders. Because we, cannot, we cannot turn everything on, we have to turn it one by one. Okay, this is one of them. 
Sterling. Okay, so now we can talk about the overfair air. Okay, so once we know how the coal are being burned, uh, so basically, uh, I should write it here, overfair. So this is the overfair air method. <clears throat> so the way it works is that first, we'll introduce or we'll use a nozzle that has both the fuel and the air, okay? But we control this nozzle in a way that it's under a fuel-rich condition. So we mentioned that a fuel-rich condition basically will reduce the flame temperature, right? And also reduce the oxygen amount. So this is good in terms of the NOx control. But we also mentioned that for the fuel-rich condition, we're not burning all of the coal particles, right? So there's always going to be some hydrocarbon left. Let's say carbon and hydrogen, maybe some oxygen here. Okay, so the remaining hydrocarbons or the unburned fossil fuels, they're being, uh, basically they're going through a stage that has air only, okay? So in this stage, we only have air here. So in this stage, the air is going to react with these remaining hydrocarbons. You see, in this way, we basically reduced, or we distribute the, uh, high, um, distribute the fossil fuels. So we have the first, first stage, which combusted most of the coal particles, while the remaining few are being combusted in the, um, basically this is over fair air, right? Over fire air. So um, in this way, we're still using all of the, um, uh, all of the heat or all of the energy coming out of the coal. Right? We're not wasting any fossil fuel there, but we distribute the temperature, distribute the energy uh, that's emitted from this combustion process, right? So we can achieve the goal of both reduce the temperature and reduce the oxygen while the, uh, while the, uh, the coal is still being uh, combusted completely. We still have this entire equivalence ratio below one, right? So this is what we call a, the overfire error. So if you want to point out where is the overfire error, this is the over, this is its location, right? Overfire error. So the lower one here, basically, it's just a few rich flame that combust the, these uh, coal particles. Um, so I think here you have a better, uh, more clear schematic diagram showing where the overfire air is being introduced. I right, see you have the few rich flame in here. Right? We introduce the overfire air above it because we know that the flue gas is going this way. Right. So in here. Again, the unburned hydrocarbons are going to get combusted in this, this region. Um, so here I also put a link. Um, so this basically have better understanding or better introduction of how the coal boiler works. So if you're interested uh, in, the, uh, in this coal fire power, power plant uh, operating mechanisms, you can use this link here. Uh, so we mentioned that um, for the NOx control, we have two methods. Right. So until now, we only talked about the incombustion method, which is basically here, the incombustion or the combustion modification. So we also have the treatment of the flue gas, right? So if you think back for the sulfur dioxide, the way we treat the uh, sulfur dioxide in the flue gases, we can use the scrubbers, right? To remove the sulfur dioxide through some chemical reactions. So we can do the same for the NOx. So the NOx can also have the flue gas treatment techniques. And generally there are four types of them. Um, so the most widely used method is called the uh, selective catalytic reduction. So I have another video about this process. Actually, I showed this during our last class, uh, but we can just uh, briefly go over this again. Disney Plus Hulu. 
ESP. SCR here is the selective catalytic reduction. Okay, so precipitator that's for PM, scrubber that's for sulfur dioxide. While the heavier particles of ash fall to the bottom of the boiler, the hot flue gas containing finer particles of fly ash naturally flows up to the top of the boiler and around, down, and out through the backpass section. The last section of the boiler is the economizer. Because of the shape and the flue gas flow path, some of the fly ash falls out here into hoppers. This economizer ash is pulled by vacuum, mixed and sluiced with water to the ash booster station where it is moved to on-site storage. Flue gas, a byproduct of combustion, exits the boiler and enters the selective catalytic reducer or SCR. While entering the SCR, Ammonia is injected into the flue gas stream where it reacts with several catalyst layers to reduce the nitrogen oxide compounds. So if we go back a little bit. So as the video mentioned, we're injecting a gas species into the flue gas, right? Let's just uh, hear it again. Exits the boiler and enters the selective catalytic reducer or SCR. While entering the SCR, ammonia is injected into the flue gas stream. Where We're injecting ammonia into the flue gas, right? So I'll later show how the ammonia play a role in here. It reacts with several catalyst layers to reduce the nitrogen oxide compounds. The flue gas then passes across the air heater where over 400 degrees of temperature are transferred from the exiting flue gas to preheat the primary and secondary air entering the plant. So this is the air preheater. We mentioned that the, the air that's introduced into the cold boiler have to be preheated, right? So um, this is the preheater where it utilizes the energy from the flue gas to heat up the air that's in the, uh, that will be introduced into the cold boiler. Okay. All right. So we mentioned that for the SCR system or the selective catalytic reductor, um, we basically we need to introduce ammonia into the uh, flue gas, right? So the ammonia works in a way that um, if you consider the chemical composition of the NOx, let's say we're talking about nitrogen monoxide, then from these catalytic reactions, we can convert the hydrogen and oxygen into water. And for the nitrogen, we can convert it into nitrogen here. Okay, so in this way, we can basically remove um, a lot of these NOx from this chemical reactions here. But we have to carefully control what is the, um, let's say, what is the molecular ratio, let's say stoichiometric ratio of these species and also the temperature. I'll show why we need to do that. So for these SDR systems, uh, in terms of their deployment, this is the most widely used system. So in terms of uh, their deployment, uh, in 2007, so around a third of the coal-fired power plants in the US are deployed with these SDR systems. So in year 2010, around half of them have it. So it was expected that in 2020, this year, 100% of all of the uh, coal-fired power plants will have these SCR systems, okay? Um, I don't have the data uh, for this year, but this is just a, a projection of the SCR, SCR system. You can see that uh, we really face these problems quite seriously. And you can see um, there are quite a lot of technique advancements during these past 10 or 20 years, right? We can um, deploy a lot of these efficient systems into the coal-fired power plants to reduce the NOx formation. So in general, for the um, uh, SCR systems, we're going to use different types of the catalysts, but um, most of them are just uh, oxides, okay? So it can be titanium oxides. Oops. 
or vanadium oxides. So titanium dioxide, uh, titanium oxide, that's generally going to be titanium dioxide. And for van vanadium oxides, um, they're generally in the form of uh, V2O5, okay? So in terms of the reaction, um, for the catalytic reactions, one thing we know that uh, one, one thing we know is that the catalyst will not participate in the reaction. They're just the carrier, right, for these reactions. So in terms of the reactions, it's just the NOx reacting with the ammonia and also oxygen to form nitrogen and water, okay? And also for the uh, nitrogen dioxide, if there are any, Okay, so these are the reactions. One is for the nitrogen monoxide and one is for the nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so this is uh, what happens during these SDR systems. But there are a range of temperature that's required for this reaction to take place. So generally the temperature needs to be around 300 to 400 Celsius or 600 to 800 Fahrenheit, okay? So there's a temperature window and this temperature window is very important because let's say if we're trying to inject, um, if we're trying to inject ammonia in here, right, to deal with the, uh, to deal with the NOx. So if we cannot control this temperature very well, then what that means is we have to introduce a different amount of the ammonia into the system, okay? So the thing is, if we introduce too much, let's say if uh, in terms of temperature, okay? so if the temperature is too low, then what that means is the ammonia is not going to react completely with the NOx. So we're going to emit ammonia. And ammonia is also a toxic gas species. It's just their concentration is relatively low in the atmosphere. So we're not listing them as a criteria or a pollutant, but this is, a toxic species. So if the temperature is too low, we cannot control the temperature well, then we're going to emit these ammonia. But if the temperature is too high, then what happens is ammonia is going to get oxidized. Okay, water, uh, the hydrogen get oxidized to water and the nitrogen get oxidized to NOx. So basically we're forming more NOx. So this is a system that needs a lot of precise control, especially in terms of the temperature, okay? So if the temperature is off, then we're basically generating more problems into the system. Okay. So this is the, um, um, how we can control the NOx with this selective catalytic reduction process. Um, so there's one, a disadvantage for this system. It's just, we have to handle the ammonia. So ammonium is very toxic. So there, uh, there will be some health hazards or the safety hazards. Um, so I'm not sure if you got a chance to visit um, coal fire power plant, but generally when they um, go through the safety protocol, they will specifically point out where the ammonia tanks are, uh, are stored and people cannot go close to the ammonia tanks, mainly because there might be some leaks. And once you inhale those ammonia uh, gas species, even at low concentrations, um, that will be toxic, that will be poisonous, okay? So this is about the SCR systems. I think we can continue uh, for the other post-combustion NOx control systems in our next class, okay? Um, so just let me know if you have any questions, all right?